Um, so I would like to present today's participants for perspectives on blended learning in the LINK program. And our key moderator today is Paul Carter. He's an online resource developer for ISS um, in BC, as all our presenters are today from BC. He has more than eight years of experience as an ESL instructor and has worked in blended programs in LINK and the ELSA program. He's also a mentor with Learn IT to Teach and is a certified Moodle course creator. His team today includes Donna. Um, she's been teaching for more than for 17 years, both locally and internationally. Um, she's teaching in a blended program right now, Link 7 and 8 at ISS, um, as well as having her own consulting business, um, Syntax Workplace English. Neil Rankin um, include, uh, is also part of the team. He's a Link instructor from ISS with for over five years. He has um, worked abroad um, for 19 years in Japan. And um, a lovely quote he included in his bio, learning to teach online has been invigorating and has been another example of how we can never stop learning. And I'm sure that the presenters today will communicate um, that energy and that enthusiasm for online instruction today. And our last presenter is Olga. She teaches blended and online classes at ISS as well. Um, she's been teaching ESL for over eight years in Canada and abroad and has a strong interest in educational technology and is currently finishing her level four Learn IT to Teach. So I will uh, switch the reins over to Paul and he'll take control of the session. Um, so again, thank you for joining today and have fun. Welcome everybody. Thanks for coming today. It's a real pleasure to have so many people here with us. We're here today to talk to you about perspectives on blended learning in the LINK program at ISS of BC. Um, ISS of BC is the Immigrant Services Society of British Columbia, and all four of us have a role there. So that's what we're going to talk to you about today. As Ellen has said in her moderation, online learning at ISS of BC is nothing new. It's been going on for over 10 years, and it always begins with individuals. Uh, people like one of my colleagues, Janice Fair, an incredible woman, uh, really amazing with computers. And many, many years ago, she started building her own website, Janice's ESL homepage. If you'd like to click on the link there, you can take a look at it. It's a wonderful collection of resources for teachers, lots of different things for all the different skills. But then a few years ago, ISS of BC asked Janice if she would allow them to put it on their website and make it part of their program offerings for the students. Um, in that, there are some password protected videos that were made in house featuring the teachers that only our students can access, but there's still a lot of resources that are available to anyone. So take a look at that site if you'd like. It's a great one. Now, as well as that, there is the uh, ISS of BC website and blog, both of which have a lot of great resources for settlement and language acquisition. And the blog especially is kind of dedicated to employment services for newcomers. So these are also great resources that have been online and ongoing for some time. Now, about four years ago, ISS of BC decided to get involved in a project a pilot project uh, using Moodle. And at the same time, some of our teachers began working with Edmodo. Now, both of these are great platforms, but over time, we've kind of decided that Moodle is the way to go. It just has a lot more variety, a lot more functionality, and a lot more options for what we can do with our learners. Mahara came a little bit after that. It's an online portfolio platform, which can also be used in conjunction with Moodle. So having these new tools starting about four years ago, this kind of brought us to a new way to teach and learn. Now, first and foremost, for ISS of BC, and I'm sure for everyone in the audience today, it's all about our clients, uh, serving their needs. And as I've heard again and again, and this morning in the welcome address from the CIC representative, um, remote learners, learners in far out places in Canada, um, learners who have busy schedules, busy lives, a lot of things happening, trying to work two jobs. Quite often it's not possible to get to school or to get to school every day. So online tools and resources can become a way where we can bridge that gap for the learners and give them more options and more accessibility so that people who choose to live in the more remote areas of Canada don't feel left out from getting the, uh, the same resources and the same tools that other learners have. Now, for myself, it's been a bit of a journey from classroom teacher to online resource developer. 
I never set out to be an online resource developer. And as a matter of fact, I only joined Facebook recently. Um, I was very much against computers for a long time. I thought that they were going to eat all of our souls. Um, apparently, they haven't done that. And we're still here today and we're still OK. And uh, I've realized that rather than being afraid of it, I needed to embrace it. And in doing that, um, Four years ago, again, when the Moodle pilot started, I got a new position teaching in what was then the ELSA 6 class, which would be considered uh, Link 7 today. And with that class came this pilot project with the Moodle. Now, the day that I got that job, <laughs> they sucked the life out of me. I like that. Okay. <laughs> Great with the chat. It's very distracting. Okay. Now, when I got that job that had the Moodle a blended class, it was three days in class and one day online, three hours accounting for a day, um, I was beginning a journey up what I call the Moodle Mountain. I'd like to compare myself here to our learners. When learners come to Canada, they have a mountain to climb. They have a language mountain, a culture mountain, and a, and a settlement mountain, really. And it takes time, and it takes patience and perseverance. But just like our learners, as you move up the mountain and you finally get to the top, Everything becomes a lot easier, and suddenly you realize that it's not so bad in the end. So the Moodle Mountain was a little daunting at first, and for anyone who gets involved in blended learning, especially with Moodle, try not to get overwhelmed, because in time you'll, you'll come to see that you can really save yourself a lot of time and a lot of prep with Moodle, and once you get the hang of it, it's really quite user-friendly, and it's quite easy to duplicate things and then just tweak them for different activities that you want to do in different sections. Now, this brings me to a a year and a half ago, I was at an AGM, and I was sitting there listening to a keynote speech from someone uh, who had come to us from Citizenship and Immigration Canada. And as we were listening to the speech, I was getting more and more excited, because just like I heard this morning in the welcome address, words like remote learning, blended classes, flipped classroom, distance education, coming up again and again and again in the keynote. And I was realizing that I was very lucky to have begun my climb up the Moodle Mountain before this speech because I was in a better position to be prepared for what was going to come down the line. Now we're all seeing it coming down the line every day and one of those things is Learn IT to Teach. Now this is where it really gets beautiful. The Learn IT to Teach program, if you're in the LINK program, is an excellent way for you to get the skills that you need to not only use courseware and platforms like Moodle, but also to design and create your own material to be using with Moodle and other, uh, other platforms online. Now, Learn IT to Teach, they provide courseware to you, and Olga is going to speak to more of that today. I believe Neil will mention it as well. But the real point of what I'd like to say about this is that nationwide, from coast to coast, there is a wealth of knowledge and opportunities for us all. Um, if you're ready to put in a little bit of extra time, a little bit of your own time, you can learn to use these things, which will put you in a better position to be ready for what's coming next from the CIC and for teaching in general uh, in a world that's becoming more and more digital every day. So I invite you all to get involved and to kind of build what you need for your learners and then share it. And if we do that, over the next few years, we'll have so much in the repository that many of us won't have to do as much prep as we're doing today. So thank you for listening. I'd like to turn it now to my colleague, Neil, who's going to speak to us about the different things that he's done with blended learning. So Neil, over to you. Thanks, everyone. OK, so um, my name is Neil Rankin. Um, hi, everyone. And I'm going to be talking about my perspectives of blended learning. Uh, I've been teaching a link blended class, CLB6, since April of this year. And there have been a lot of challenges, but a lot of benefits. And I'm going to talk about these. First of all, um, what does a teacher who begins with a Moodle need? And I think just basic computer skills. Because um, while I'm not completely inept, I'm hardly technologically gifted. Um, I don't do either Facebook or Twitter. And I've got a very ne neglected LinkedIn page. And but. I, I'm able to do it. And one reason is we've got really, really good, strong online training. And this is a surprise to me at how important this was. I always thought that I was more of a face-to-face -face learner, but actually I found the online much more valuable because you could go step-by-step -step and work at your own pace. I think there is, uh, there is a role for face-to-face -face training. I think if nothing else, for psychological reasons, to meet the other teachers who are involved, 
uh, maybe discuss problems, but just knowing that there are other teachers out there and it's not just blank cyberspace. Now, um, how about the students? Um, first, there needs to be some sort of initial classroom orientation. At the very least, using a smart board, um, but even better would be uh, using a computer lab. You cannot just give them uh, a page with login uh, information and say, go to it. They need to be shown around the site at first. After having done this, then they can go on and then they can do their training with online videos. But again, you need some initial orientation first. Um, as well as giving orientation, I think you really need to at first sell the idea of online learning. There's a real sort of misconception that the students are, are losing these three hours when they could be learning directly from the teacher. So right from the start, I think it's really important to point out the, the benefits of blended learning, which I will now talk about. The first benefit is the amount of individual attention that you can give each learner. Now, before I started um, blended learning, uh, I didn't realize that even in a three-hour group class, there's so little time and so little scope for individual attention in the students. But then when I compare it with uh, blended learning, online learning, let's say if it's a speaking activity, you can listen to um, a recording of the student, you can listen several times, you can give uh, detailed feedback, and you can make personalized comments that, of course, the other students don't see. So much more individual attention. Uh, another benefit, um, this sounds like a cliche, but I think there is a chance for a wider community. And um, as an example of this, there was one case where students had, to, had an assignment where they had to find a source online in a library and post what they found um, their findings on a forum. Two students connected um, in this way, and actually they started talking, chatting online, and they arranged to meet at the library the next weekend. So this is really neat to see because this kind of friendship or connection was forged online. Um, I think the next is obvious. Uh, I think this is maybe the number one reason which is cited for um, how online learning is good, especially with evening students. They have work, they might not be able to come to class every time, they come to class late. But with online learning, they can work at their own pace, they can repeat activities if they need be. So for them, it's a real benefit. Um, and also, maybe this is an emphasis emphasized enough, in some ways, um, the variety of materials which is developed is really hard to match in a classroom setting. Uh, you can have, in one unit, you can have video, you can have reading, you can have audio, you can have self-correction quizzes. So actually, this is, this is, I think, a real intense workout, and it's really hard to match uh, in a group class, especially when it's in the evening, students come to class tired, uh, they just don't have the energy. Okay, um, but as well as benefits, there are challenges. Uh, I think the number one challenge was, and this is what students complained about a lot, was their problems in finishing the work. Um, as time went on after about the two month work, this is, they, they all complained about this. And I think it's really important to emphasize what we have as a three hour rule, um, that as long as they spend three hours, even if they don't complete the whole unit, they're marked as present. I mean, of course, if they finish everything before then, that's also very good. Also, I think it's really important, especially with weaker students, emphasize planning in steps. So if there are four steps in one unit, have them do a different step each day, not just leave the whole work until the night before. Okay, complaints. Um, students will complain, and I think it's important to give them an outlet for those complaints. Let them, let them bitch about it in class. Let them have um, 10, 15 minutes to do this if they want to. So this is, it's both an emotional outlet, but also this can have um, practical applications too. There might be some technical matters that you can deal with uh, right there and then, or which you can at least refer to the administrator. Also, sometimes, and this has happened, um, when other students have heard other students complaining, they've managed to deal with the problem. So you need to give an outlet for complaints. Okay, also to be honest, in my case, 
teacher limitations. Um, as I've already stated, I'm not a technological whiz. And so I've been really honest and upfront with the students right from the start that this is the case, that um, I'm learning with them. Um, and uh, on the other hand, I think it's important at least to try, if there is a problem, to try and fix a problem by yourself. Uh, but if not, you can communicate with the course administrator. Uh, <clears throat> next. Um, also, I mentioned student completion of work, teacher completion of work. Why? Human nature being what it is, people like to procrastinate. So you can't just do the work when you want to. You have to wait for the students to post work. Uh, one way around this is try to be prompt in your replies. And also, you need to set some sort of firm deadline or things will never get done. Um, now, some lessons that I've learned. Um, I think the students who really benefit are the strong ones. And uh, for this, there was a, one student who, towards the end of her class, we had a progress report and interview. And I asked her, are you, do you think you're progressing with your English? And she said, oh, yeah, very much so. And the main reason I'm doing so is because of the Moodle. The Moodle is so good. On the other hand, I think weaker students mm -hmm. with either weaker computer skills or English skills, um, they have a harder time and they need more support. Um, now, this in support, at the very, very least, I think you need 15 to 20 minutes, if nothing else, with a smart board. What would be better would be a computer lab. And if you only have 15 to 20 minutes, you can preview materials. And, um, and also, during this preview, you can deal with any uh, possible problems. Now, this is especially valuable for weaker students. Um, also, um, uh, regarding attendance, Again, as I said, let them know about the three-hour rule. And also, um, if you know about the Moodle, it's kind of creepy. You can see everything the students do. So I think you need to tell them this, that they can't just log in and watch a movie for three hours. Uh, they actually have to do the work. Um, if there are any attendance problems, you need to deal with them uh, promptly. Finally, um, just a note about feedback. Um, of course, this is very important. I've tried to uh, give some, the Moodle is good in that you can easily copy and paste for correction and feedback, just copy and sort of include some der, um, corrections. And I found this is really pretty easy and it doesn't take much time and the students uh, appreciate it as well. So um, that's my part. I would like to now uh, hand over to the able hands of Donna. Great, thanks Neil. Okay, um, my name is Donna Makniak and I teach the blended learning link for employment CLB level seven and eight. Um, welcome to my living room. I hope the cat doesn't bother us much here. Okay, for my presentation outline, uh, first I want to talk about linking in class to online. Secondly, how to motivate students. I think Niels mentioned some of those points too. Third, teachers combating challenges. Fourth, student feedback, including advantages, disadvantages. And finally, I'd like to talk about benefits for teachers. Okay, so ideas to link in class to online, so important. Um, I have a smart board in my class, so I can easily make the in-class vocabulary games, which help review the online vocabulary, and students always love games. Um, secondly, uh, in-class grammar exercises. I take uh, writing errors from the forum and bring them into class, especially if there's common mistakes, for example, with present perfect. Of course, I take out any private information. Uh, next, I like to do in-class discussion questions from the online reading assignments. It's a great way to check in with comprehension and just hear what their opinions were on the assignments. Uh, next, I love to do in-class quizzes. They don't like it so much, but I like it. Um, and they're based on the online assignments. Of course, I do it after the deadline. Sometimes I tell them about uh, the quiz. Sometimes it's a surprise. Um, some more things I like to do uh, to link the class to the online. Um, In-class share sessions. This is very informal. It's students share what they learn online. I like to start a Monday morning uh, with that, like as for a warm-up. Uh, next, I like to review in-class pronunciation exercises. 
that we did in class with the audio files that I add to online. So I have um, made audio files for all my pronunciation exercises. This is great because then they can review it at home. Um, I post optional homework online that, I, that was identified in class. Somebody asked me for some extra article practice, which I grimaced because how do you make uh, articles interesting in class? So I just posted some optional homework online. And then uh, for those who did it, I posted the answers in class. Um, last, I like to discuss the form questions in class before posting. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes it's a good way for them to brainstorm some ideas and it's good for the uh, less confident students to build up some ideas before they do the scary part of posting. Um, next, I want to talk about motivating students, my busy, busy students. Um, giving lots of feedback on writing really motivates them to write even more. Um, it's more work for me, but I definitely see results. They produce more if I give more feedback. I try as best as I can to correct assignments quickly. Um, immediate feedback motivates them to do their work if I do mine. Not always easy. Um, I like to get lots of student feedback, then we can have optimum assignments, and then I find out about all the technical problems they're having, because sometimes they don't tell me. So it's really good um, to check in with them often. Um, some more points about motivating students. Again, I can't emphasize enough communication, check in frequently on progress. I'm sure I sound like a broken record with them saying, what step are you on? Did you do the listening? But I just want them to know I'm, I'm, I'm there, I'm watching. Um, I also like to remind them that it's a preparation for work life. This is a workplace uh, class uh, link for employment. So I remind them about practicing for real life with deadlines. And also students ask me to be their job reference a lot. So again, I remind them that I include in my reference whether they did their online assignments or not and met deadlines. Um, we also like to attract them to our site with information about events in particular job fairs, workshops, festivals, etc. It's a great way to motivate them to check out the site. Um, okay, so I'd like to also talk about teachers combating challenges. Again, broken record, check in regularly with students. I'm always asking them how's it going because that's really when you find out if they are having problems. Um, at ISS, we have a student training course. I think it's about nine steps students can do um, as much or as little of that training course as they need, depending on their computer skills. Um, also in class, I have a new student orientation. I get the um, experienced students working on something else and I pull out the two or three new students, get them at my desk and introduce them, introduce them to the site, make sure they can sign on, show them where the, training, the student training course is, et cetera. Um, I also like to do peer support or a peer buddy system where I encourage students to either help each other, talk to each other, or if there's a particularly weak student, I like to match that student with an experienced student, get them to exchange contact information, and therefore help each other out. So really, that's been very, very effective. Um, how big are my classes usually? My classes, uh, someone, Rosita, has asked mine are about 12, 12 students on average, I would say. Um, student feedback. Fortunately, I have more advantages than disadvantages listed. Um, students have told me they love to receive the instant feedback with the self-mark quizzes. And with those same quizzes, they can resubmit and correct errors, which is good review, they've told me, and then they can learn more. Um, they like to use their free time for educational purpose in planned way in coordination with the teacher instead of just doing random um, English exercises online. This is more organized. Uh, they like the one week deadline. They find it's very manageable with their schedules. Um, some more feedback uh, from my students about advantages. They've told me they learn a lot from the teacher comments on forum writing, uh, which encourages me to give them more feedback. They've told me that it's exciting to participate in new ways, like with wikis and forums. They love the paperless, and it improves their technological skills for future online courses at BCIT, UBC, wherever they're going next. And they love the fact that they can do their assignments anywhere and anytime. Um, the last thing, well, the, sorry, the next thing I wanted to talk about for student feedback is the, some of the disadvantages that they've told me about. Um, one student told me that he didn't like it, that some online quizzes are not suitable. If you miss one answer, you get a low score. 
So it's disheartening. So we have to be careful about the type of assignments we put on. Uh, they've told me sometimes it's boring, too mechanical. Uh, no surprise there. Um, they've told me that there's no transcript for the listening exercises. So that's something we have to work on at ISS. Uh, technical problems, but I mean, that's with any computers and uh, it's good practice for real life. You're going to have technical problems. And lastly, uh, no access to materials after graduation was the last uh, disadvantage. Um, the last slide I'd like to talk about is the benefits for teachers. Uh, for me, I really like the fact that in class we can do more speaking and pronunciation because that's what you want to do when you've got the students in front of you. Um, so when they are looking for more reading and writing, you can easily direct them to online. Um, it's helped me make a stronger in-class curriculum as I can identify areas of need through the online. That's been very helpful for me. And I love to get to know the students even better. I can identify their needs as they are, I don't know, a bit more revealing with the problems they're having. And I can focus more on what they're telling me when I'm not in a busy, noisy classroom. Uh, lastly, for me personally, I've really loved this experience uh, teaching online. It's great, pro good professional development, and it's good experience for me to have as a teacher. So that's all I have for you today. Um, so I'd like to pass you on to my esteemed colleague, Olga Kanapelka. Olga. Uh, yeah, my name is Olga Kanapelka, and I'm a teacher for a blended CLB5 class, and I also have an online class, which is CLB4 to 6. And in my part of the presentation, I'm going to be talking about the training for students and teachers at ISS of BC and the additional training that you can, uh, you might want to take with Learnity to teach. I'm currently working on stage four of the training, and I've learned quite a bit, and it's helped me quite a bit in my uh, CLB class, so um, blended class, sorry. So I'm going to tell you about the skills you can learn and uh, about each of the four stages. I'll show you an example of the improvements I have made to my courseware, thanks to what I learned in stage two and stage three of the training. And finally, I'm going to also share some tips to engage the students uh, in the blended course. OK, so let's um, have a look at the training for teachers and students at ISS of BC. Um, we are going to be looking from left to right, because I want to compare what students get and what kind of training teachers get. Okay, um, so this, both the students and the teachers get the course overview, the introduction to the course, uh, which are mainly videos. Our talented curriculum development team, they have made lots and lots of how-to videos, which are always a lot easier than uh, reading the documents, a lot of instructional documents. Uh, also, Students learn how to use different tools and how to participate in different activities. So they have practice assignments because we realize that videos alone are not enough. Teachers also learn how to use tools and participate in activities. They also learn about their weekly duties, such as how to change the dates, how to open and hide new sections, how to give feedback to the students, and track students' participation. Uh, I have a question here from Tina. How do you get the training if you're not currently teaching? So this uh, training is ISS of BC only, but you can get a training from Learnity to Teach, and I'm going to be speaking about it just a little bit later. Okay, let's move on to the next slide uh, and look at the different ways learning is delivered at ISS of BC. As I mentioned before, our curriculum development team has created lots of screencasts showing exactly how to use each tool in Moodle, which is very helpful. And it's a lot easier than just reading. Uh, students get some practice materials, and teachers get a sandbox course. Teachers also get a simple student account. So you could see exactly what a student can see when they log in uh, to the course. Okay, when the students start using the new courseware, they will 
of course, have a lot of questions. So it's really important to set up some class time for questions and answer sessions each week. We also take our students to the computer labs and yeah, and uh, have peer support sessions and answer any questions the student might have. Uh, for it's also really important to have so that the teachers, so PD days are vital here, especially at the first part introduction of the blended learning to, to the school. Uh, so it's really important to share challenges, tips and tricks, different class connections, uh, et cetera, with your colleagues. Uh, I have a question from Jan. Are any of you how-to videos available from YouTube? Um, yeah, as far as I know. Paul has created lots of them and Janice. Yeah, the webinars are great. Um, now I'm going to be speaking about Learn AT to Teach. This is a free training. Uh, it has four stages and it's funded by Citizenship and Immigration Canada. And I will tell you more about each of the sections and what you can learn at each of the stages. So the first stage of the training is actually face-to-face. -face. That's the only face-to-face -face session. You get introduced to the training. You get your teacher login. And you create your profile and watch an overview video in that session in the stage one. Then you begin your online course, which begins with a pre-stage two, which is uh, an introduction to the course where you learn about different link activities that you can use, about link courseware and uh, its resources. And you can also learn about different ways that the courseware can be used. At stage two, stage two is a hands-on training. You learn how to manage students' account how to help your students to update their profiles, change their passwords, etc. You also learn how to view the course as a student. You learn how to do this by showing and hiding the content, how to edit activities, how to add links and upload documents. You start customizing the contents and creating some simple activities like a page, a label, and a choice activity. And finally, you look at the many great resources that are already available to you at tutela.ca. Okay. Stage three. In stage three, you learn how to use more advanced features for managing the course. For example, how to um, use the feature which is called completion tracking. It means that you can open an activity when the student completes the previous activity or you can open an activity on a specific date, so exactly when you need it. You also learn how to enhance course interactivity and content with blocks, and I will talk uh, about it a bit later and show you some examples of blocks that I've made for my course. You will learn how to add resources, how to create some activities, and upload them on Tutela to share with other students, with other teachers, sorry. For TESOL and Members, there is extra benefit. They actually get a post TESOL training certification. Fortunately, in BC, we do not get that, training, that certification. All right, that's the most advanced training uh, stage in which you learn how to create your own activities, not the Moodle activities, but the activities using the free software, such as Hot Potatoes and uh, Text Toys. You also learn how to upload your activities onto Tela to share them with other teachers. And I will want to, would like to give you an example of what I have learned in the training. I'll show you different blocks that we are using on Moodle. The examples will be from stages two and three. First of all, messages block. It's actually built into the courseware, but I still wanted to show you. This is a great tool to provide quick help to those students who have problems with uh, an activity or technology. 
the students really need to know that they're not alone in the course and the messages block really are helpful to provide quick help. At stage three, I learned how to make uh, RSS feed blocks and I was really excited about this one. Uh, I really wanted my students to come back to the course and I wanted to create a central place where they can find all of their favorite links uh, in one place. So I put on the weather blog for my students, uh, the news blog for the high level students. For my CLB5 students, I actually have uh, a link to um, news in simple English. Yeah, the RSS feed blocks, I love them too. And if you would like to share your favorite links with your students, you can use HTML blocks. For my CLB5 class, I put up a block with uh, Genesis ESL links, which is a great collection of resources. And my students love to go there and practice, get extra practice. I also have uh, job search, volunteer opportunities, website links. And also for my students, um, I'm sharing a link to my Google uh, drive folder with their classroom pictures so they, they could they could access their class pictures at any time okay and finally I will also I would also like to share some ideas about engaging students into blended learning a lot of students worried about their writing skills which is especially true for bridge students they want to write more and they want to get a lot of feedback which is not always possible to do face to face, but it's easy to do online. Well, it can be time consuming, so I'd like to share some tips with you how to provide feedback to the students. So when you give us a student uh, feedback, use a sandwich technique. Always stay very positive uh, because the students, I think, are very sensitive when they're online. So thank the students for their participation. Thank you for sharing the ideas uh, and say what they're doing right. For example, they did, uh, they, they used good grammar or used good vocabulary or structure, etc. Correct only two or three mistakes at most. Do not overwhelm students with more mistakes. And also if the mistake is repeated, give links to external resources. Uh, to get some extra practice and read uh, grammar explanation. Also, collect the links in a separate document uh, to reuse later, to just copy and paste. Ask student to write, to do something with the feedback, um, something like write a new sentence with the feedback that you, given, you gave them. Or alternatively, you can collect several common mistakes and bring them to the class. And also, always finish on a positive note, of course. OK, this concludes my part of the presentation. Thank you all for listening. And let me hand this back over to Paul. Pretty good. Thanks, Olga. That was really interesting. And thank you to Neil and Donna as well, and everybody in the chat box. What an exciting place that is. There's so much going on. So we've all had a chance to speak to you today, and uh, there's a few links and sources here that are on our slides, which we're going to put up on the Tutela site after this presentation. You can access them there. If you want to take a look at where these things came from, you can find a lot of it here. And now if you have any questions, we'd like to take them through the chat box. I also have a few that I wrote down during that were coming out of the chat box that I feel maybe we need to answer again or answer a little bit more. So if you want to contact any of us directly, you can do that through Tutela on the uh, the group site there. The link is there for you, but uh, you can just go to Tutela and you'll find us. So just to begin, um, maybe what I'll do is I'll read the questions out and then Olga, Neil, and Donna, if any of you want to jump in with an answer beyond what I'm going to see, that would be excellent. And if anyone wants to add more to the chat box at the same time, you're more than welcome to do that. So the first question that I took down here was, uh, during the blended learning, do you ask your learners to be on at a specific time? Um, I believe Neil answered that a little bit in the uh, chat box when the question came up. And I wanted to say that uh, sometimes, sometimes we do do that, especially in our full-time online courses. Just yesterday, I had a series of online meetings with my full-time online learners. And it's really important that we have that face-to-face -face time and that it's scheduled. 
because the learners need that speaking and listening practice and the communication with a human being beyond the written word. So those are really scheduled. Uh, many of the courses also offer a weekly text chat. So it's a chat in the Moodle that's based on text, and it's a scheduled time where the learners know that they can find uh, other people, including the instructor there, to ask questions or just to chat. So did anyone else want to say anything else to that about uh, being on online at a specific time? Feeling good? Yeah, I didn't know that. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> we got a lot of courses at ISS. I forgot to say in my introduction, there's over 25 online courses now, uh, blended and full-time online at ISS at BC, and very few of us know what's going in, going on in all those different courses. Okay, the next question that I took down again from the chat box was, what kind of supports are provided to the students with lower technological skills? Um, this came up a few times in the chat box as well, and uh, quite often the learners, the other learners, the classmates, can be your greatest resource in terms of giving extra support to the others. If you have a computer lab or a classroom computer, this can be a great place for partner work where more advanced learners technologically can help those who need a little more help. And at the same time, again, for our full-time online learners, we really have to offer them a few more resources with that regard. And so we actually have scheduled times when they all come together in person, uh, usually in Whistler, which is kind of the center of the area that those full-time uh, online courses cover. And they actually have hands-on training with someone there to facilitate that for them. So we do do our best beyond the videos to see what we can do to help the learners. And again, fabulous staff at ISS of BC. Every teacher gives 110%, I think, and is always there ready to help the learners if they have a question. Did any of the others of you want to respond to that at all, uh, supporting students with lower technological skills? Um, I think I think I mentioned that uh, I have paired up the students with lower technological skills with students who are good leaders and those who have higher skills and have been in the class longer. Do a little peer support, peer buddy support. Yeah. I, I think it's a, a challenge, for example, in my class, those are great ideas, but we only have uh, two face-to-face -face meetings. So it's, it's like a real challenge trying to balance the needs of the, of the online learning with getting enough face-to-face -face time. Very true, Neil, yeah. Olga, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, well, as I mentioned my part, a uh, smart board really helps a lot. And I sometimes just open it up on a smart board and I get that student who is experiencing some technical difficulties to come up to the smart board and actually try it out. And the other students are always happy to help. Yeah, that's wonderful. Great ideas, all of you. Thank you. Uh, the next question, it wasn't really a question, but it was a comment. Uh, someone typed, uh, no access after grad. I've heard this one too as a problem. I believe you mean access to the material that's online. Uh, something I did when I was actually a blended teacher with the classroom and face-to-face -face is I'd really encourage the learners and try to help them understand how to uh, either copy and paste or download the resources in the Moodle. Uh, most of the stuff in the Moodle you can either directly download it to a document on your computer or if you know copy and paste you can get it all out of there. So if a learner stays on top of things as they're moving through the Moodle, they can really be taking all the links out, all the feedback out, and building their own file, even in a single document that's kind of everything they did on Moodle. I don't know how many learners are willing to do that. Quite often you'll have learners say that I can't access something, but they actually can if they want to take time. So there's a lot of ways to get things from the Moodle so that you can keep them at the end. So I just wanted to address that. Did anyone else want to speak to that? Well said, Paul. Sweet. Yeah, no, I've been doing it a long time, so there's a, uh, some little tricks that can help along the way. Uh, the next one, uh, Neil, you had someone say to you, and you did respond to them, thank you, about what you meant by copying and pasting feedback. Yeah. Um, do you mean the same feedback for all students? How does that work? Doesn't it need to oh, be individualized? It, 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 depends, it depends what they write. Uh, sometimes I might just copy and paste um, a sentence from their post, and um, either... I might make a correction or just uh, put in bold what um, what the area is and sort of uh, see if they can identify it. So depending on, I mean, I don't uh, copy the whole passage, just something which uh, may be a sentence or two or three sentences, and maybe either corrections or just um, highlight or bold and see if they can uh, understand what the problem is. 
And as, yeah, as Hugo said, you don't want to necessarily uh, highlight every single mistake. Yeah, that's so true, Neil. Yeah, thanks for saying that. Donna? Yeah, can I mention something about copy-paste? When I think about in terms of uh, giving feedback, uh, I have most of my answers electronically saved, so I can copy-paste the answer. So if students, students get good, A and B idea. wrong, I just paste the answer in there. Hmm. I do the so, same thing with my students. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Such a big time saver. Yeah. Yeah, that works well. Sorry, John, I, I, I zoned out a bit there on the chat box. I hope I'm not okay. repeating you. The thing I wanted to add here is that what I was copy and pasting when I was giving a lot more feedback than I do now, as I'm not teaching as much, is I had a, a long list of really useful websites that would address particular repeated errors that the learners were making again and again. So different learners making the same error again and again. One link sometimes is all you need to give them. So if you have a, a file of useful links saved somewhere, you can copy and paste from that. And then the learners really do get very individualized feedback with links that will help their specific issues, but you're not searching for that link every time. So you can paste that in there as well. Yeah. Everybody good? Did I totally just repeat you, Donna? No, that's a different oh, answer. So that's good. Sweet. Okay, right on. It Thanks. seemed like you were listening. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> I shouldn't have said anything. All right. The next thing I had from the chat box I wanted to check in on was uh, how do you get the training if you're not currently teaching? I think uh, Catherine Rockwell may have answered that in the chat box as well. But unfortunately, for Learn IT to teach training, if that's what the uh, person who typed that meant, um, you do have to be a link teacher. Um, it's CIC funded and they're only funding it for people who are delivering link through a link provider. So it's really unfortunate. But as I said in the chat box, if you go to YouTube, if you go to Moodle.org, uh, through the Edmodo site, any of these platforms provide lots of training for you online that's free as well. So just because you can't get into Learn IT to teach doesn't mean that you can't be getting ahead with blended learning in the flipped classroom as well. I hope that answered that question. Anyone else want to speak to that? Feeling good? All right, I've got I think, two more here. Uh, or no, sorry, I've got one pasted twice. The last one is uh, interested to know how many teachers have done a MOOC, a massive open online course. Uh, that is being in the position of a student. Greatest way to see hands on what it's like for our students. Uh, British Council for Future Learn has some good courses. So MOOCs, yes, MOOCs are very controversial, but very fabulous in my opinion. I've never actually been in a MOOC myself, but I know several students who have, and they reported uh, really good experiences with them. Uh, the closest I've come to being in a MOOC was the training that I did through ElsaNet, which is now Listen here in BC, where we did our training in a Moodle course, not really a MOOC, but uh, a chance for me to be in the position of a student. And I think that's a, a great thing about Moodle as well, is that you can put yourself in the role of the student at any time, and so you can see what the learner sees in comparison to what the teacher sees. So uh, Donna, Neil, Olga, have any of you been participants in a MOOC? No, I haven't. Nope. Sounds like a good idea, though. But. Oh, they're awesome. There's some really great yeah. sites. If you just Google MOOC, uh, you'll get tons of stuff. So, yeah, thank you, whoever put that in there. Unfortunately, none of us have. Oh. I'll get rid of that document there. Oh, it looks like Eugene Sason has taken some free courses on MOOCs, but it's so easy to fall behind and then drop out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sounds like our full-time online student. <laughs> 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 That's a really good point you make there, Eugene. I, I, just to speak to that, I've, I've often said to my learners in class, you have to milk it for all it's worth. Um, we provide these free link courses to them, uh, but you can lead a horse to water, right? Uh, the learners have to want to learn, and we're all human. We all know how easy it is to not do something rather than to do it. But just like MOOCs and just like Moodle and just like any kind of learning, whether it's face-to-face -face or blended, um, motivation of the learner is key. So I think things like we saw this morning with Powtoon and Jen Artan's uh, presentation, um, other fun resources that you can add to the Moodle to get the learners engaged. Uh, hopefully you can get a sm snowball effect going where more and more learners get engaged and then they tell the other learners and everyone kind of gets involved. But it is a challenge. Um, students don't come to class and students also don't log in sometimes. So it's really something we all have to deal with. Did anyone else want to speak to that? Nope. No. Nope. Good. Okay. How is your student attention for your online courses? Um, 
That's a really good question from Eugene there. I think our retention's pretty good overall, eh, everyone? Um, most of our courses, I'd say the bulk of them, uh, except for two, are um, blended. And so there's face-to-face classroom time as well as online. So it's usually a, a three-to-one ratio or maybe a two-to-one, however it works for the different locations. Um, the full-time online course, uh, that one, student retention is high when there's learners who are really motivated to learn. Um, I've recently taken on one of these full-time online courses, and just in the short time I've been in there, I've seen one learner come and go right away. But the nice thing about online and remote learning is that it really opens up the base of where your learners can come from. And so we actually have a waiting list for that course. And as one learner leaves, if they're not engaged or participating, we just fill their spot with someone else. And it doesn't take long before those spots are filled with people who are engaged and motivated to learn. And so those who don't want to do it, they kind of come and go quickly. Yeah, uh, Donna, Neil, Olga, anything to say to that? Um, I don't think I don't think it, what I've noticed is it's not so different from a normal course. So I don't think people leave or not leave as a function of the online learning part. Yeah, that's a really good yeah. point. Olga, yeah. Yeah, I started my online only class, I believe, four to six in uh, October, at the end of October, I think, and. Uh, I, and I think our retention is really good there. I, I do have uh, seven students, and most of them participate pretty actively. Sometimes it, that people get overwhelmed. They probably think that online learning is quite simple, and they just can't do nothing and learn and get the certificate. But then when they see that there are assignments and CLBs, and, uh, and they have to participate in Skype meetings, some of them might get overwhelmed. But yeah, majority of them stay, and they are pretty active. Yeah, it's very true. It's very true. Um, I don't know if there's any questions right at the moment, but uh, there was something that came up earlier that I wanted to talk about, um, the idea of learners connecting with other learners and other people. Um, on our Moodle, there's all the different courses, and the different courses are kind of isolated from each other. But within Moodle, there's two features. There's the blogs, the site blogs, and the tags. Uh, tags are just your interests from your profile page and also attached to different wiki entries and glossary entries, but it's the blogs. Um, as the online resource developer, I create the, the activities for all the different courses except for the, the one that Donna's working in, which Janice takes care for us and a few other uh, great individuals at ISSFBC. But the point of this is that uh, I did create an activity for the blogs where I gave every single course at every single level from CLB4 up to CLB8 the exact same blog activity to do. Um, it was for the Christmas holidays. It was about Christmas in Canada. And the learners, as they did this activity, were all brought to this blog page where all the learners from all the different locations and different sites all across Greater Vancouver and the Lower Mainland, for that matter, could all engage together on a similar topic or on any topic of their choice. So I really do appreciate that about the Moodle, that it does open the door to connections between learners, between locations, and right across the nation, uh, as we can see through Learn IT to Teach and other things like that as well. Yeah. Okay, gosh, there's so much to read in that chat box. Thanks, everybody, for making this so exciting. Like that. Yeah. Okay, I don't know. Does anyone have any other questions that they'd like to ask us today? Looking good. Okay, I think we covered everything. I hope I haven't missed anything from the chat box there. If I could just step in, Eugene did have um, an interesting question to conclude your excellent presentation today. His question was, if you had a choice to choose 100% face-to-face or a combination of blended, which would you choose? You can only choose one and why. Oh. Anyone like to go first? You That's know what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> I'm going to say blended all I, the way. I really yeah. do, Adonna, sorry to, to jump in, but uh, you can just, yeah. 
there's so many opportunities to increase the amount of communicative time in the classroom if the learners are learning something before they get to class and also the retention of the material they've learned can be so much more enhanced by a little bit of review and practice online after the class so blended definitely and also addressing different learning styles I think is very important uh, the classroom isn't suited to everyone and quite often the shy students are the most vocal in the wikis and the forums online uh, Donna you wanted to say something there too um, well mine's a full-time class so it's pretty easy for me to see say blended because we have 21 hours in class and four online um, so I really love the four hours online um, but I'm not sure what my answer would be if I had fewer um, in class hours because that is so incredibly valuable that face to face and practicing speaking and listening well not so much listening but speaking and pronunciation has to be face to face is best yeah, it's really true, Donna, what you say. And as technologies do improve and, and video streams get better, the video chats are a great alternative for courses where learners are in remote areas or perhaps yeah. can't actually come to the class. But it's yeah. really true that face-to-face, -face, you know, it's, it's essential. All, all the soft skills that they're picking up, like mm -hmm. interacting with each other. I mean, I agree with remote learning, but I mean, for my students, they're preparing to be in the Canadian workplace. So it's really helpful to help them interact with each other as you might do in the Canadian workplace. I'm not so, so sure how you could do that online as effectively. Yeah, it's really true. Uh, you can try using things like contact assignments sometimes and then have the learners report back on the Moodle as to their experience. But again, uh, you're not actually present for that face-to-face -face communication. Yeah. Oh, so, oh, sorry. Uh, what about the argument that blended increases feelings of isolation, but agree like blended? Well, someone who's coming to us from Tatiaktak might disagree with that. <laughs> they might feel a little bit more included through uh, remote learning. Um, uh, isolation, yes and no. Um, just yesterday, I spent all day interacting with people through video chats in my online course, and uh, none of us felt isolated. We were all uh, having a great laugh together, actually. One of the learners <laughs> pulled her son onto the camera and forced him to sing for me. <laughs> <laughs> and what an experience, you know? And the poor kid was so shy, so at the end, I pulled, out, I pulled out my guitar and played a song for them. <laughs> And when is that going to happen? That's not going to happen in the classroom, right? Uh, just, I'm sorry, I'm ignoring the chat box now, but a, a lot of times too, my kids or even my wife will come on camera and then join me in the chats with the learners. And it just, it really increases their feeling of engagement and, and not isolation, but rather inclusiveness. So I think I've gone on about that. Elena, I'm looking at the time and I know you had a few things you wanted to say. Yes, I'd like to thank each of you for taking the time to present to us today. I think from a pers uh, perspective of someone who listened ra with rapt attention, um, it was a lovely and well-presented uh, workshop on blended in a link environment. So well done and thank you to all.